Welcome to the fourth lecture in the Henry VII series. Today we will examine how Henry dealt with the two popular rebellions that he faced during his reign. This lecture will be split into four parts. We will first examine what a popular rebellion is and why they were different in nature to the dynastic threats that Henry faced. We will then move on to examine the Yorkshire Rebellion of 1489. We will then examine the Cornish Rebellion of 1497. Finally we will examine the impact of these two rebellions on both Henry's finances and his style of government. The easiest way to determine whether or not a threat was a popular rebellion is to consider whether it began with discontent from the population aka the common people rather than from the nobility. Whilst the dynastic threats that Henry faced were politically motivated, the popular rebellions were rooted in socio-economic problems. In the late 15th century, 90% of the population were subsistence farmers living in rural areas of the country. This meant they produced enough food to pay their rents to their local lord and to feed their families, but little beyond that. Most were agrarian or crop farmers, traditional peasants who worked the same fields in the same region that their forefathers had for centuries. Popular rebellions often came after harvest failings which could plunge entire communities into poverty. This is because there was no social welfare in the Tudor age so if a peasant family fell below the poverty line, this would result in malnutrition and desperation. If the harvest was good, the peasants would produce enough crops to sell surplus at the local market. But if the harvest failed, the reverse happened and the families would starve. When pushed to this extreme, the community would rebel. This rebellion often came in the form of a petition of demands to either their local lord or, if serious enough, to the king himself. In Henry's reign, both the Yorkshire and Cornish rebellions were centred around a petition for tax relief. During the Tudor age, tax was not a monthly payment that came out of a person's salary. It was often ad hoc, the king would summon parliament to ask for a subsidy and, if granted, tax collectors would visit every village in the country. Henry asked for three subsidies during his reign. The first was to deal with the Earl of Lincoln's invasion and to fund the Battle of Stoke in 1487. This first subsidy did not cause rebellion. However, on the other two occasions, the demand for tax caused a popular rebellion. However, it would be too simple to say that the rebels were simply trying to dodge a tax payment. There was usually economic hardship that drove peasants to join a rebellion and this often linked to a harvest failing. Sometimes, there were other aggravating factors that pushed them to such an extreme action. Some historians have argued that the two popular rebellions show regional discontent. This was a time before England had an efficient transport system so the commands from the king in London felt to some like an imposition. They resented paying tax to a king who lived so far away and whose policies had little relevance to their lives. The Yorkshire Rebellion took place in 1489 and relatively little is known about it. At its peak approximately 5,000 rebels were petitioning the king for a tax relief. The demand for tax followed a parliamentary subsidy grant in 1488 of £10,000. This was so that Henry could launch a military campaign in Brittany. However, the people of Yorkshire resented paying for a tax to support an invasion on the continent when historically they had been exempt from this type of tax. This is because they paid a local tax for the defence of the Anglo-Scottish border. The fourth Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy, travelled south on behalf of the commoners to petition the king. The Percy family had been the largest noble family and magnates of the north since the Norman conquest, as the earls of Northumberland. The fourth earl had commanded Richard's reserve army during the Battle of Bosworth, but had not deployed these reserves at a critical point in the battle. By 1489, 
He was looking to gain the trust of the king and rebuild his reputation. However, when he arrived at the royal court Henry refused to listen to the petition and he had to return north empty-handed. Percy returned to York in April 1489 but when he announced that the king had rejected the petition for a tax exemption, the mob of peasants turned riotous and killed him. Some reports suggest that the murder of the fourth Earl of Northumberland was an example of a regional power struggle between the powerful Percy family and an illegitimate line of their house, the Egremonts. This is because Sir John Egremont became the leader of the Yorkshire rebels. His personal ambition to overthrow the established and legitimate House of Percy is considered an example of bastard feudalism. However, other historians argue that the case for bastard feudalism was overstated. Sir John Egremont was not the original leader of the rebels. That was a fellow named John a Chamber who came from relatively unknown origins, showing that at its heart this was not a local power struggle but rather a rebellion sparked by socio-economic discontent. As a result of Northumberland's murder, Henry took the threat seriously. The last thing he needed was for a bastard line of this ancient and noble house to seize power of the north. Therefore, he made a wise and calculated move. He released Thomas Howard the Earl of Surrey from his incarceration in the tower. As an experienced war commander, he was the best nobleman to lead a royal army north, and so he was provided with 8,000 troops. Since the Yorkshire rebels were outnumbered 5,000 rebels to 8,000 royal soldiers, they dispersed before Surrey could pitch battle. Chamber was captured and hanged for treason, but Sir Egremont was able to escape into exile, where he found his way to the court of Margaret of Burgundy. Henry rewarded Surrey for his loyal service by appointing him to the position of President of the North. This was a savvy move on Henry's part since Surrey's power base was in the south of England so it was very unlikely that he would be able to muster a private army powerful enough to threaten Henry's position. In addition the North were used to being governed by the Percy family and this change in leadership would have helped to quell the unruly region. Surrey remained devoted to his service in the North until he was summoned back to court in 1499 so to accompany Henry to a trip to France. By 1509. Surrey was one of Henry's key advisers and even became one of the executives to the king's will on his deathbed in 1509. Let's now turn to the Second Popular Rebellion, which happened eight years later in 1497. This took place in the semi autonomous region of Cornwall to the southwest of England and it was more serious than the Yorkshire Rebellion for two reasons. Firstly, it was much larger in number with the rebel horde numbering 15,000 at its peak. Secondly, the rebels were able to march to the outskirts of London before it was quelled. Cornwall was a semi-autonomous region of England at this point, with its own language and political system. It was also a very rural area with very poor transport links to the rest of the country. Therefore it was known for being unruly and resisting any intervention from central government in London. Once again, the main reason for this rebellion was tax. In 1547, Perkin Warbeck had travelled to the Scottish court to curry the favour of James IV. Henry had to prepare for a military invasion of England from the north and so he sought a subsidy from Parliament. However, the Cornish did not want to pay this tax because the conflict was taking place at the other end of the country and so too remote to have any impact on their lives. Plus they usually were exempt from taxes for the defence of the Anglo-Scottish border since they paid a local tax to defend the south coast from piracy. The rebellion was also more serious since it was directly aimed at deposing the king's two financial advisers, the Lord Chancellor John Morton and the Chancellor of Lancaster, Reginald Bray who had been the ones responsible for collecting this tax for the crown. A contributing cause for the rebellion was the closure of the stannaries. These acted like a late medieval trade union since they represented the miners of Cornwall's tin industry. They held a lot of power in the region since tin mining was the main economy of the southwest. <laughs> 
In an attempt to gain more central control over the region, Henry had closed the stunneries. This caused discontent among the local elites who owned the tin mines. The rebellion also gained noble leadership from a local baron called Lord Audley. He had military experience and he was able to organize a march, which moved from Cornwall into Devon and then to Salisbury and Winchester before turning toward the capital. The rebels were able to reach the outskirts of London by June 1497, in a place called Blackheath. However, the city dwellers of London took up arms in support of their king and barricaded the city walls to prevent the rebels' entrance. When the rebels pitched battle, the royal army was able to easily defeat them. In total, 1,000 rebels were killed in the battle. Following this, on 28 June, Lord Audley was publicly executed, alongside other key ringleaders. However, the rebellion was not completely in vain. Henry agreed to reopen the stunneries as local parliaments in the southwest. They are still in use today. However, this did not end the threat. There was a second rebellion in September 1497. This was sparked by the arrival of Pretender Perk in Warbeck. By this point the king had already brokered a deal with James IV called the Truce of Iton and as part of this Warbeck had been expelled from the Scottish royal court. Seeing a fresh opportunity, Warbeck headed to Cornwall to capitalise on their discontent. He gained support when he promised to put an end to the tax. He was declared Richard IV of England on Bodmin Moor and led a division of the Cornish rebel army, numbering 6,000 men. He took siege of Exeter before marching on to Taunton. Henry did not hesitate to deal with this second rebellion. He deployed his best division of soldiers under the leadership of experienced commander, Lord Daubeny, to deal with the threat. On hearing of Daubeny's arrival, Warbeck tried to flee but was captured in Hampshire. In some ways, the Cornish rebellion did Henry a favour in this regard. If Warbeck hadn't sniffed out this opportunity, he would have almost certainly returned to the court of Margaret of Burgundy, where he would have regained strength and continued his overseas plots. Let's now examine the impact that the two popular rebellions had on Henry VII's government. The greatest impact was financial. Henry struggled to collect the taxes that he needed to launch military campaigns. In the case of the Cornish Rebellion, the money Henry had originally levied to defend the Anglo-Scottish border was used to put down the rebellion that the tax had caused. Luckily, Henry was a strong diplomat and so had resolved the conflict with James IV, so he could redeploy the funds. But this strange irony shows how precarious his position was, even in the late 1490s. It also helps to explain why Henry pursued a largely peaceful foreign policy he knew that England's economy wasn't strong enough for wartime taxes. A subsequent impact of these popular rebellions was that Henry did not want to rely on Parliament anymore. During the late medieval age, Parliament's primary purpose was to grant taxes, often to fund military campaigns. At the start of Henry's reign, he used Parliament to pass important acts that bolstered his security and ensured that he was seen as the legitimate King of England in the eyes of his subjects. However, by the late 1490s, Henry did not need to do this. The two popular rebellions taught Henry that he could not rely on parliamentary subsidies of tax as a financial revenue. Therefore, from 1500 to 1509, Henry called Parliament only once. Underpinning this, popular rebellions show that England had to heal after 50 years of civil war, both socially and economically. The common people accepted Henry as their king even though he was a usurper arguably because they were weary of war and sought stability. Therefore, the people who lived in the more remote regions of England were content while ever the king did not interfere too greatly in their way of life or tax them to a point of economic hardship. Henry recognized this and this is why he never sought an aggressive and expensive foreign policy. The same could not be said for his son. Let's return to the overarching question of, how did Henry VII deal with popular rebellions? 
In the exam, you are not likely to get a question that is solely focused on popular rebellions, you're more likely to get a question about threats in general. Therefore, it's important to distinguish popular rebellions from dynastic threats and then explore the underlying socio-economic problems that caused both the Yorkshire and Cornish rebellions. You are unlikely to have time to discuss both rebellions in detail. If you choose to discuss the Yorkshire Rebellion, you need to discuss how the murder of the Earl of Northumberland destabilised the governance of the North of England. You could then discuss how Henry overcame this problem through the appointment of the Earl of Surrey as President of the North. If instead you choose to discuss the Cornish Rebellion, focus on how this was a serious threat to Henry due to the number of rebels that amassed under the noble leadership of Lord Audley and the additional complication of Perkin Warbeck's arrival. Henry dealt with this through military might, but it is also worth noting that his strong use of diplomacy in dealing with James IV meant that he had the financial resources to effectively quash this rebellion. Finally, consider the impact of these rebellions. They provided a clear message that England was not ready for heavy taxation, that the country was still recovering from the War of the Roses. It also meant that Henry sidelined Parliament in the latter half of his reign since Parliament's primary role was to act as a tax-granting body. Thank you for listening. This lecture concludes the subtopic of how Henry consolidated his position and overcame threats during his reign. Tune into the seminar to learn how to use the information you have learnt to construct an essay on Henry's consolidation of power. The next series of lectures will examine how Henry governed his kingdom.